Uh, hello, colleagues. Today uh, we have uh, our next external speaker, David Predorovich Kale. He's an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. David's research spans optimal control, dynamic game theory, learning for control, and robot safety. While he has also worked on problems in distributed control, reinforcement learning, and active search, he is currently investigating the role of dynamic game theory in multi-agent interactive settings such as traffic. Predrovich Kale's work also focuses on the interplay between machine learning and classical ideas from robust adaptive and geometric control theory. David completed his PhD under the supervision of Claire Tomlin at UC Berkeley and did a postdoc at Stanford University with Mark Schwager. So let us start. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much for the kind uh, intro. And it's great to be here, if, even if it's just uh, virtual. I wish it was in person. Um, uh, just to make sure, you guys see the main slide screen, right? Right. Cool. OK, I have a you know dual monitor set up, so it's always a question. Anyway, um, cool. So really happy to be be back. And um, uh, for those that I know, it's, 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 it's great to uh, see you again. Um, and uh, for those that I haven't met, um, I, I guess uh, I was interning at Neuro in the summer of 2018, so it's it's been a few years now. But um, but uh, wonderful to stay in touch and uh, looking forward to meeting uh, everyone. So um, so the talk today is going to be um, kind of have two parts. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to model multi-agent interactions as games that are played over time. Um, so, so there's a modeling question, and then we'll talk about solution techniques for both the forward problem, you know, how do I take a description of the interaction as a game and compute uh, rational kind of equilibrium solutions. So we'll describe that part of the problem. And then we'll also talk about the inverse problem. And this is uh, sort of if you observe some uh, agents interacting, let's say, on the road, maybe changing lanes or something like that, and you want to understand uh, what were their objectives when they were uh, interacting? How do you infer those things from what you saw? So we'll talk about both forward and inverse problems. Uh, I'll present um, a, a bit of the mathematical background behind how these things work, as well as you know just some of the uh, results that we see. So please interrupt me at any time if you've got questions. The talk is, um, you know, I try to be fairly informal about uh, things, but go into depth where I think it's uh, particularly interesting. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt. Also, um, just because I'm in the presenter mode here, I can't see anybody. So I can't see the chat. If, um, if somebody could monitor that for me and, and just pop up and interrupt me, that'd be great. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, I say games and I say interactions, interactive decision making. I've got a lot of things in mind. Um, you know, the, the first one that comes to mind for probably all of us is traffic. Um, and that's actually where I was exposed to these types of problems was, was at Neuro. So, um, so we'll kind of dig into the traffic problem as a case study in just a second, but obviously traffic is, is uh, a case where uh, intelligent decision makers interact with one another uh, over time. But these types of problems in the math, uh, mathematics and algorithms that we'll develop describe lots of other situations. So uh, I'm illustrating like a uh, power grid with some um, renewable elements that turn on and off at different times of day depending on the weather and there's uh, dynamics to how um, how those happen but also how current flows through uh, wires and how demand uh, patterns evolve over the course of a day so um, so these types of problems also appear in the power grid and they also appear in other types of transportation networks so here I'm illustrating I think this is like Delta's uh, connectivity network in the US but but anyway um, passengers going from point A to point B to point C over the course of a day, uh, a week, a month. Um, these are uh, could be viewed as kind of competitive decision-making problems where different passengers are competing with one another to get good prices. They're also competing with the airlines, et cetera. So um, essentially the same mathematics describe all of these types of situations and many more. So hopefully that'll become clear throughout the course of the talk. Let's dig into the traffic setting as a bit of a case study to kind of motivate where we're going with this. So um, probably anybody who's, um, uh, certainly anybody who's on the, the planning side of things, but uh, anybody who interacts with planning is familiar with kind of receding horizon model predictive sorts of control schemes. So that's um, a pretty pretty natural way to think about decision making in a dynamic situation. You kind of try to 
uh, see what the world looks like now, maybe make a prediction of what you think it's going to look like in the future, um, design an optimization problem that tells you what good behavior ought to look like, and then solve that problem for the next you know, few seconds, start executing a strategy, and then uh, repeat it as quickly as you possibly can. So, so model predictive control is a really natural idea. And you can kind of think about taking the ideas we'll develop in this talk and rolling it into something similar, but uh, I'll call it a, a model predictive game. So kind of at each step, instead of solving an optimization problem, you solve a game and that would tell um, you, the uh, ego decision maker in a particular situation, how should you behave given that other people are also uh, rational decision makers in the problem. Okay, so let's let's kind of build this up mathematically. All right. So um, if you think about just the single agent view for a second, um, let's pretend that we're this particular card that I picked out. Um, what you would do is say, okay, the decisions I'm going to make over the next little while, this um, U star that I'm uh, pointing out, this is the minimizer of some. Uh, objective, this J thing that is totally arbitrary, subject to some constraints. And here I'm just uh, stating the ones that are kind of hopefully uh, the minimal ones. You know, I got to pick um, uh, controls and states that yield a dynamically feasible uh, trajectory. And I also need to make sure that that trajectory starts where I currently am. So I need to make sure the initial condition matches whatever my sensors tell me, uh, wherever they tell me I am. Um, and this is basically the optimization problem you'd solve. It looks something like this. Maybe there's other constraints like, please don't leave the lane, please don't collide with another car, something like that. But basically, it looks something like that. And you plug this into your favorite optimizer. Maybe it's ILQR, maybe um, you use an off-the-shelf thing, uh, you know, IP ops, SN ops, pick your, pick your favorite. So this is uh, a typical optimal control problem, and that's what it looks like. But since we're on the road and since we know that there are other cars out there, what we're always going to end up doing is looking at a few other agents in the scene, and, you know, hopefully all of them, and making some kind of predictions about what they're going to do. And those predictions I'm highlighting in blue. So for these two other agents in the scene, I'm saying, well, um, maybe I have a fancy machine learning model that tells me, uh, I think agent two is going to go straight right now. I think agent three is going to go straight. Um, maybe these could be uh, wackier and have some probabilistic side to them. But but the bottom line is I make some prediction about what's going to happen. And then that enters my optimization problem somewhere. Here I've put it in the objective. Maybe it enters the constraints if I actually want to enforce collision avoidance as a hard constraint. Hopefully we do that. But in any event, um, it factors in somehow to this optimization problem. And this is still a normal, uh, honest to God, nonlinear program. It's nothing fancy. This is, you know, Textbook stuff. Okay, so this is this is the single agent view. Contrast that with the game view, which is to take the same three agents and just imagine that actually they're rational decision makers, and the trajectory that they follow is um, you know arising from an optimal decision making problem. So actually, agent one, agent two, and agent three are all simultaneously minimizing their own objective. And each one's objective, in this case, depends on the decisions of the other ones. Uh, and of course, they have constraints um, that sort of are analogous. They need to start at the sort of uh, current position that, that we think they're at, and they need to be dynamically feasible for those vehicles. So if one of them is a light little Prius, maybe uh, its dynamics are different because it's got less inertia. Um, so maybe its stopping distance is shorter. I don't know, but but in any event, there's there's uh, different constraints, different objectives, and the decisions of each car, each driver, um, factor into the objective of each other uh, agent in the problem. So so this is a game, and these are the types of problems that we're going to be trying to solve in this talk, uh, at least the forward problem. All right, does this uh, setting make sense to everybody? Uh, maybe it's good to pause here just to take a, a questions before we move on to make things concrete. So maybe here the uh, x, which are like some prediction, is this like in here like uh, those are marginal prediction or would it would this con uh, prediction be like conditional prediction or like you know some prediction taking into account of interactive? Yeah. Inter so so 
I, I think in the language you're using, this would be a conditional prediction. But let me just be precise in case I'm misinterpreting what you mean by that. So um, here what I'm saying is let's look at player one. Player one's uh, objective, this J1, depends on, uh, among other variables, it depends on X2, the state trajectory of uh, CAR2. OK, but that trajectory, I, I'm being a little bit fast and loose with the way I wrote it down. But that depends on player two's problem and player two's choice of input. So, um, so it depends on on the second problem in this in this picture, and the second problem, uh, his cost depends on the first problem, the first player's variable. So these are coupled. Does that make sense? I say okay. So like in this multi-agent setting, they depend on each other, and then. Uh... Eventually, just to try to solve this giant optimization problem. But in the single agent case, X, those are usually just a marginal prediction, like just observing others' history. And maybe, like, you know, in the ML model, for example, you can encode some of the past interaction among all the agents. Totally. But uh, those X will be just, uh, you know, based on all my previous observation and then trying to predict what they are going to do. And they don't consider exactly right. like interactivity here. That's exactly right. So this here in this slide, uh, like X2 is just, uh, this is saying, hey, no matter what I player one do, uh, this is what I think player two is going to do. So it's not conditioned on what player one is doing, if you want to think about it that way. And in this picture, every player's decision is sort of, they're all mutually coupled together. OK, yeah, thanks. OK. Uh, okay, so this is a this is a mathematical game. Uh, are there any other other questions before I move on to the nuts and bolts? Okay, let me uh, do that, but feel free to interrupt uh, anytime. Okay, so let's just um, yeah be a little bit more precise here. I I was kind of throwing around terms uh, a little fast and loose, and let's just let's just drill down. So. When I talk about a game, and especially a game played over time, there's really kind of three important defining characteristics. OK, so the first one is the objectives. Like, what does each player want? Here, I, I'm going to pretty consistently use a variable capital J with a superscript I to describe what does player I want. Um, and this will depend on some state information. So, so the state trajectory, that's x, and the inputs, the control inputs, actions that each of the players is choosing over time. So uh, I'm going to try to be consistent about this. Hopefully, I, I did it correctly. But uh, superscripts will always be players. Subscripts will always be time. Uh, I'm assuming that interactions are happening over a known sort of fixed time interval. So maybe this is 10 seconds, 100 time points, you know, 10 hertz control rate, something like that. But the bottom line is it's a discrete time problem. And uh, every player is getting to make a control decision. Um, that affects the state somehow. We're going to describe how. And all of that together factors into the objective that each player has. So this is the objective of the problem for each player. There's also rules or dynamics. So you know, just like when you play chess, you need to know, OK, if, if player one makes this move, player two makes that move, this is what the board will look like next. The board is the state x. Uh, the actions of each player, the moves they make, that's the variables u. And uh, there's some. Uh, map that takes those two things and uh, outputs the next state in the problem. So uh, in chess, that's just the rules of the game. In uh, traffic, this is physics, right? So if I apply a certain amount of acceleration at a turning rate, my car will go to another spot on the road and have a, you know, another velocity or something like that. So, so the rules of the game define how states evolve over time as a function of inputs. Um, and the last and kind of most subtle piece of this puzzle is what information does each player have access to at a particular moment in time? So we're going to talk, we're going to drill into this um, uh, a bit more. I think this is easily the most interesting piece of this uh, type of problem. So we'll, we'll talk more about this. But, but basically, um, you can imagine trying to play chess. And if you play, try to play chess, uh, you know, normally that you're, you're knowing that uh, in the future, you're going to get to see the, you know, see what the board looks like. So you'll have access to that information when you have to make a move. But then, uh, you know, your strategy would probably change a lot if you knew that you wouldn't get to look at the whole board, but you only got to look at, let's say, your half of the board. 
Um, so um, this is a pretty uh, critical but subtle piece of the pie. All right, and there's different types of solutions that you could um, you could maybe look for in a game. In this talk, we're going to focus on something called the Nash equilibrium concepts. If you've heard of game theory or studied game theory before, this is certainly where you started. Um, it's the kind of standard starting point for all games. It just means uh, a Nash equilibrium is a set of strategies for all the players where, um, you know, if player one looks out and fixes, you know, imagines that everybody else's strategy is known to him and is fixed, then player one is happy with his strategy. And if that's true for every player, then we're at a Nash equilibrium. So it's kind of pretty natural concepts. Um, all right, so those are the, that's right. the nuts and bolts. Uh, yep. I have a question. What is the yep. gamma here um, on the right Oh, column? I'm just saying it's some function. Um, it's just any, so so the I'm saying you, the, the input, the action of player i at time t is just some function I'm calling it gamma of something, of whatever information player i has at time t. That's the question mark. OK. And also, so for, like, yeah. OK, and the other question is, yeah, I'm not sure if you're going to talk about it. Um, but here, you seem to make a very strong assumption that everyone is, uh, you know, rational or trying sure. to op trying to optimize its objective. Um, but is that a true case, right? Like sometimes, I mean, in this mm -hmm. case, it feels like every players are cooperative. Um, but maybe in the real world, oh, they're not cooperative, right? I mean, player one can want exactly the opposite thing of player two, right? So yeah, I'm superscripting like, day with with the players, so they can be totally different functions. Yeah, but my 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 question is like you know for this kind of setting, how realistic is the assumption for this formulation in real world driving, for example? Yeah, uh, very very good question. Uh, the honest answer is um, I don't know and I don't have the data, and uh, you have the data, so you should check. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, no, in all seriousness, um, people have been using these models in economics for you know seventy years now, um, and they're predictive in some cases, but not predictive in others. So if you've heard of like bounded rationality, that's a broad area of decision theory that tries to kind of come up with reasonable types of relaxations of these problems, um, both in the single player and the multiplayer settings. So, um, so there are, I think quite reasonable issues with these types of models. Uh, the part, I guess the, the word on this that I would have for the purposes of this talk is going to come up in the second second half, where we talk about inferring the preferences of a particular player. So, um, so for example, let's say player one is um, you know, being a little irrational with respect to a particular objective. Maybe there's another objective for which he's optimal. Uh, can I infer that objective? Um, so uh, I think that this this model is really expressive if you're willing to to kind of bend what you mean by objective, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there other questions here? All right. So I'll just make this concrete briefly, and then we'll we'll get into solutions. So. Um, back to the traffic setting, let's say I want to concrete, you know, concretize those three ideas, um, dynamics, objectives, information, in the setting of traffic. I might come up with sort of kinematic or dynamic models of how cars and pedestrians and so forth can move. Maybe I keep track of standard stuff like positions, uh, headings, front wheel angles, whatever. Um, those would define the dynamics, uh, you know, just basically trigonometry. Uh, as far as objectives, I'm sure uh, I don't need to uh, really go go into too much detail here. You guys know better than I do. But but uh, you know how do you define what good behavior looks like for uh, a car to make forward progress in a lane and avoid collision? You could sort of come up with an objective for each player, model their behavior as though they were minimizing some combination of basis functions that look like this. You know. You know something that penalizes going away from the center of a lane, something that penalizes going away from a you know nominal speed, something that penalizes being close to another car, um, whatever you want. So I think I'm going to leave this as a big engineering design decision, which uh, is not too satisfactory. But that's not really the point I'm trying to get at in this talk. Um, so suppose that 
I can model every player's objective in terms of functions that look like that. Um, and then the information, uh, what information does each player have access to when they make a decision? Um, maybe that could be just the full state of the game. So uh, at time t, if player i uh, has access to all of the state variables for every car, every pedestrian in this picture, then uh, and then makes a decision, that would be full state feedback. Um, maybe that's a little too aggressive. Maybe we don't have access. Maybe it's not reasonable to know that. Then we would have to consider a reduced information set and um, talk about a different set of strategies. But this is just an example. All right. So how do we solve these guys? Um, I want to kind of give a, a, a bit of a, a intuitive start, and then the, the actual kind of you know the, the actual way we do it. So the starting point. You know, in any event, is to think about these problems as coupled optimization problems. So the things that I wrote down in this uh, slide early on with the, the cars in traffic, um, every player was solving a problem like what I'm writing down on the top right here. Um, the ith player was minimizing his objectives subject to some dynamic feasibility constraints. OK, so what you might consider doing is um, you know, thinking about letting, let's say, player one uh, solve his problem while holding other variables um, that he doesn't control fixed, and then pass in that solution to uh, other players. Um, uh, the next guy, let's say player two, player two solves his problem but holding player one fixed, and then you know continue around robin until you hope, hope to God that you converge. Basically, the issue with with so this is an old algorithm. It's called iterative best response, but um, you know the issue is obviously it doesn't converge all the time. So you can just cook up a real dumb example like rock, paper, scissors and see that this immediately breaks. So like in a game like rock, paper, scissors, if player one says, gee, I'm going to play rock, and then player two thinks, OK, well, I know you're playing rock, so the thing I prefer to do is probably play paper. Now it's player one's turn to you know, resolve his problem. He says, ah, you're playing paper. I don't like rock anymore. I'm going to play scissors. And you can pretty quickly see this will cycle. So, um, so basically, this algorithm is intuitive, but um, if you, you know, this is not what you should do if you actually care about solving these things. What you should actually do is something a little bit more intelligent, which goes like this. So think back to those uh, coupled optimization problems and then put your optimization head on. And probably the knee jerk reaction you'll have is think about optimality conditions. So if you write out the optimality conditions, at least the first order ones, um, you get something that looks like this. So basically, you introduce dual variables for uh, all the constraints, so all the, in this case, just dynamic feasibility constraints. So each player gets a Lagrange multiplier at every time. And then um, just take the, you know, the derivative of the Lagrangian for each player with respect to his variables, set that equal to zero, and enforce that all the constraints are satisfied. Um, well, that's what I just wrote down. So it looks like a, a pile of uh, uh, just a, a mess of math, but that's all it is. It's just a series of nonlinear equations, um, you know, nonlinear functions that have to equal zero. So at the end of the day, if I want to find, um, you know, actions and, and state trajectories, uh, and I guess Lagrange multipliers that jointly satisfy all these equations, they will be some kind of equilibrium of a problem. Um, you could find those with any, you know, root finding. Uh, procedure of your choice, so standard sort of Newton method would be just fine. Um, you know, if you uh, can squint hard enough and pretend this is just the one player case, this is exactly like the basis for ILQR, for example. So anyway, uh, Newton's method, good stuff. Um, it's going to find a first order stationary point for these. Uh, it'll find a you know satisfy the first order. Uh, conditions for all the players. So that's not satisfying second order conditions necessarily. So you have to be a little careful. Um, just like you do in any uh, any other second order algorithm, you've got to check the second order conditions at the end. Um, so if you do that, you'll find some kind of Nash equilibrium. If you don't, you just call it something like a local quasi Nash. That's the technical term. Basically, it's a critical point. That's all of this. OK, so uh, let me just take a quick pause here. Are there um, any questions? Sorry, what is the complexity of this compared to uh, single agents? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, so so Newton's method, it's a second order algorithm, which means you know this is about as fast as you could ever hope to solve 
uh, a problem like this. And the complexity, um, basically, the every step you end up having to invert the Jacobian of this big function G, uh, Jacobian with respect to X, U, and lambda. So uh, that operation is uh, going to be cubic in the total dimensions of all the variables. So let's say that each car in this traffic example had uh, n state variables, um, just ignoring the other variables for a minute, n state variables. Then if there were k uh, cars, k times n total dimensions for x, and you know maybe the other ones scale linearly too, well, they do. So then you end up getting cubic in the number of players. So like uh, this compared to this uh, single agent, like uh, MPC kind of saying it's a cubic or um, more complex than that. In the number of players. Yeah, exactly. OK. So but if, you reduce, if you reduce this, like if you just imagine that there's only one player and you write out exactly what I'm writing here, it will give you exact like Newton on this will give you uh, essentially the like better version of IOQR. Like IOQR makes uh, a particular approximation, so it's not exactly Newton on this. It's uh, you drop a couple terms, and uh, this just wouldn't drop those terms. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And other and questions here. Yeah, I was going to say it's it's cubic, but it's probably the case that this, these are like really sparse, right? Like a lot of the, you know, if we're talking about a scene that has 100 agents in it, a lot of them mm -hmm. just don't have interactions with each other. And we can just apply a lot of heuristics to make those zero out. You are so right. Yes. So I'm giving the worst case, like if everything was dense. But uh, actually, you can immediately see that there's a lot of sparsity, even just in the constraints. So the constraints only apply that sort of like only involve variables at adjacent time steps. So like if you think about the Jacobian of this big um, function G, that's going to be a big matrix. But at least the terms corresponding to the third row, those will be banded. So like uh, a ton of zeros. Um, and the same is going to end up be, being true for the other terms too. OK, yeah. maybe like uh, the other question is, uh, you know, in practice, for example, if you try to implement, I'm not sure if you have like tried it on way more open data set or whatever, like mm -hmm. if IOQR takes about 10 milliseconds to run. In practice, mm -hmm. if you want to run it, how much time? Oh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see that in just a sec. But the bottom line is uh, anything you're comfortable running IOQR on, you should be comfortable on for this, um, like unless you have a ridiculous number of uh, cars, like this should be fine. Second order, bottom line is second order convergence is really fast. So like for what I mean by second order is like, this is not a gradient method. Gradient methods are slow. This is a second order method, it, it exploits. Uh, so, if you so if you do Newton's method on this, right, you're gonna take the Jacobian of G and then solve a system of equations. So the Jacobian of G, that requires you to take another derivative. And when you take a derivative on the right-hand side of G, you're seeing second derivatives pop up. So because you're exploiting that second order gradients information, you're going to converge way, way faster than if you just have first order information. So um, yeah, I mean, typically, how many iterations would you hope to see in IOQR? I don't know, maybe 10 at most, I would hope. Uh, maybe a couple more if you're really unlucky. So same thing here. Do you have a question about the quality about those local solutions? Do we need to warm start this the optimizer to get the good solution? Because you can imagine, even for a single player, right, there are many local solutions that, that is not good, mm -hmm. right? Like the left, right, the home top is at different different local zones or ahead of behind decisions that are different the local coastal regions that will give you saddle points. So, but yes. for the for the game, right? There are even more. The dimension of the cyber points just gets exploded, right? When you have more number of agents. So, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. are there any good heuristics, or or you didn't say this issue at all? So, th this is just beautiful. Oh, uh, you definitely need heuristics. This is a local algorithm. Um, so, standard heuristic for like motion planning sorts of problems is just initialize with your last solution, right? Um, something like that. 
you'd probably do that here too, at least but in, that's what I've done in the past. Um, if you do that, you know, it's not rocket science, it's gonna be just fine. Um, on the other hand, you do get into issues, right? Like if your previous, uh, like if you have additional constraints, I've ignored them just for the sake of notational convenience, but if you have like hard collision avoidance constraints, and let's say a new obstacle pops up and your previous trajectory is infeasible, then you got to be a little careful. Um, so um, there are, you know, there's no free lunch and there are some hard problems with initialization, but they're the same problems you would see in uh, the single agent context. And exactly like you said, the dimensionality has just increased linearly in the number of players. So, you know, there are potentially more uh, kind of homotopies to consider. And actually, I'll have a nice graphic in just a few slides to kind of get at that uh, for one example. Yeah, thank you. I think this makes sense. The high quality initial yeah, points, the warm up, it become very important here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I mean, I should also say, like, the same is true in the single agent case. If, you know, if you had a convex problem, like linear dynamics, so linear F, and uh, you know maybe quadratic or convex objectives, uh, then you know same thing here. You wouldn't have a problem. Cool. All right. Let me uh, let me just jump forward just uh, for the sake of time here. So let's just stare at this for a second. And I want to have a, just a quick quick um, dig into the this point of informational structure. So uh, I just developed this kind of Newton esque root finding thing. And I very um, intentionally did not mention any kind of informational concerns. So I want to just just think for a second, what information is this expression of players' problems? Uh, what, what assumption is it making about the information that player one, let's say, has access to when he makes a decision at time t? Well, uh, it's a little bit opaque from just staring at it. But if you think to yourself, OK, Let's suppose I've got a solution to this problem. Uh, well, this is just a sequence of states, x at time t, and uh, actions u i for player i at time t. And it's just indexed by, by time, basically. So what this is saying is that uh, player i can basically just solve this problem. Well, all the players can solve this problem together. And then player I can look at his watch and say, ah, well, OK, it's uh, three time steps from when I started. I'm going to uh, do this action. And then, OK, a few time steps later, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, it's uh, time step eight. I'm going to do this action. I don't need to like look out at the world and see any other information to play out this strategy. All I needed to know is what time it is. So this is called an open loop strategy. So if you're, you know, when you're solving ILQR, for example, this is the type of thing you're getting. You're getting a time indexed sequence of uh, controls to apply to the car, for example. Um, those controls don't actually depend on the state of the car. Of course, the state factors into the problem, but that's because there's some low-level controllers that are probably trying to track things. But as far as IOQR is concerned, it's, uh, you know, it's spitting out just a trajectory, a sequence of stuff over time. Um, this, I'm being fast and loose a little bit, and I'd love to dig into the details. But that's essentially what's happening and it's the same thing that is happening in the way I just wrote down the problem. So this is this is a, a subtle point that I want to dig into in just a, just a bit. So so there's lots of different types of information structures, and the two kind of polar opposite structures are feedback information. Uh, everybody knows everything at time t, and open loop, where basically all each player knows is the time and you know what was the state initially. Like they they know where we started, and I know what time it is. And, and that's it. So you can kind of think about this as if you're playing a feedback strategy, like you play in chess, you know that in the future, you're going to get to see what the state looks like. You know, what does the position of the board look like? And uh, and then you're going to decide what to do. But you will get to see the board. Uh, in, if you're playing an open loop strategy, you know that in the future, you're not going to get to see what the state looks like. You're just going to get to see what time it is. And you'll know where you started the game. So that's, it's kind of like playing with your eyes open or eyes closed. That's the informational difference between these two. And it's, uh, I think it's fairly, like, it's obvious when you look at the equations that I put here, like action at time t for player i is a function of something. But that's really subtle, and the implications are not clear, like, how different these really are in terms of trajectories. So I just want to 
pull out two real quick examples to illustrate like how crazy different these can be. So here's like a, a really neat little counter example that a friend showed me, which is uh, imagine, you know, player one and player two are two cars. They're just in the plane. Um, player one wants player two to end up at the origin. Okay. And player two just wants to get close to player one. And they're both lazy, so they both have kind of control effort penalties. Okay, so player one starting from the bottom in this figure, player two starting from the top. And I'm going to show what happens in feedback and an open loop. So before I do that, just take like five seconds and guess to yourself, like, which color is which? Is green feedback or is green open loop? Okay, so turns out green is feedback. So what's happening in feedback is that player one, the guy on the bottom, he knows that in the future, um, player two is going to get to see the state of the game. In particular, player one knows that, aha, if I start going towards the origin, then player two is going to see that I'm going towards the origin. I know player two wants to go and get close to me. So if I just go to the origin, then you know he'll see that and he'll end up wanting to go to the origin too. Okay, so that's why they both end up going towards the origin and then uh, circling around there. All right, uh, in open loop, it's blue. And you'll see, you can tell it's radically different. And the reason is, in open loop, what's happening is player one knows that, hey, in the future, no matter what I do, the only thing player two will know is he'll know what time it is and he'll know where I start and where he started. So in particular, if I turn to the right, and go towards the origin, player two is going to have no clue that that's what I'm doing. And so, so play, like any decision I make can't possibly affect what player two decides to do. So uh, the best thing I, player one, can do is just to minimize my control effort and do nothing. All right. Player two uh, is also aware of the same sort of uh, reasoning. Player two is also aware that uh, he's never going to get to see player one again. Player one's never going to get to see him again. And player two basically just goes towards player one. And in this case, the figure I'm showing, they had some uh, non-zero initial speed. So player two kind of says, okay, well, I know player two is going forward um, because I saw his initial condition. So I'm going to kind of go towards where I think he'll end up. And that's that's the open loop equilibrium. Turns out uh, these are unique in this particular example. So this is definitely exactly what they are, and um, and they're radically different. Like if you make a different informational assumption about what players know at each time, you will find radically different solutions. Um, so this is to say that if you kind of are naive about the way that you encode the problem and the way that you solve the problem, you could end up like no matter how many you know how frequent your planner runs, like how tight your MPC loop is or whatever, if you're always finding the blue solution. And actually, players get to see each other, then you will never end up going to the origin. It doesn't matter how fast you solve the problem. Okay, so the point being, information structure is this subtle part of the problem that really affects the solution. And it's important to, to nail it and get it right. Okay, so uh, we saw how to solve open loop problems. We're going to develop how to solve feedback problems in just a just as a slide or two, but I want to give one other example that I think is particularly relevant to self-driving cars, which is encoding politeness. So, um, you know, different ways to think about being polite on the road, but a pretty natural one is to think about uh, player one caring about how much effort player two has to uh, has to um, put forward in order to uh, achieve what player two wants. So maybe this is uh, player two doesn't want to hit player one, you know, player one's merging into player two's lane, neither, neither one wants to collide. So if player one does this super aggressively, player two might have to slam on the brakes, and that would not be a polite thing for player one to have forced. So that's the kind of intuition I'm trying to get at here. The way you might try to encode this in a game, something like this, you might say, hey, let me imagine that the objective player one wants to minimize is uh, whatever he nominally cared about, this J1 tilde, plus um, you know, some norm of player two's decision. So basically, don't, don't do too much. Don't make player two act. Um, well, turns out, if you try to solve an open loop game with this objective structure, you'll just, like, 
this will just make no sense. And the reason is, uh, you'll see the optimality conditions that we wrote out before um, end up essentially destroying that norm term that I added because I'm taking its derivative with respect to variables that don't affect it, that it doesn't depend on. Okay, so that's what I crossed out in red. In feedback, though, uh, it turns out that player one's decision at time one affects the state at time two, which then player two gets to see and base his decision at time two on. So actually, the derivative of player two's action at time two depends on player one's action at time one. So this derivative is non-zero. So that's essentially why feedback is kind of a more powerful concept uh, than open loop structures if for, for purposes like this. All right, so how do we solve feedback problems? So what is it? What is feedback? So feedback is basically just the existence of a dynamic programming sort of solution. So what does this look like? Basically, you can kind of think about drawing a tree where I'm going, you know, kind of every layer of the tree is a different time step. And the branches are kind of decisions that players can make. And I'm being very fast and loose with how I draw this tree out just to keep it visually simple. But basically, if you're solving a dynamic programming problem or finding a feedback equilibrium of the game, at the root of the tree at the top, you're needing to, uh, like the, the optimal strategy for each player at time one should account for the fact that in the subtrees, in the sub games, players are also in equilibrium, given that they started there. So it's um, the, the way that you would kind of typically solve this um, in an optimal control setting for folks who are familiar would be you'd work from the bottom up to the top. You'd work, you'd work backwards in time. And the same thing can be done in a game too. So, um, so this is kind of what feedback is really encoding. It's encoding dynamic programming. Um, it, mathematically, uh, just to be precise, um, typically you'd assume that objectives for players are kind of sums of things over time or other kind of things that compose nicely over time. And you would write out that sort of dynamic programming principle like this. You'd say, okay, the strategy for player one, player I at time T as a function of his state X at time T, this is the minimizer of his current cost and his optimal cost to go. Okay, but each of these problems, I'm kind of nesting the constraints. I'm saying, okay, uh, dynamic feasibility needs to be true. That's the bottom constraint in each case. And the ones I'm boxing, those are just saying that in the future, all the other players need to be following their own versions of this strategy. So um, I'm writing out the ith players, but you know, really we would kind of uh, realize that all the other players are solving the same problem and they're all coupled together. So the thing is, they're coupled together over time. That's exactly the sub-game equilibrium structure in the tree. And if you kind of write it out carefully, this is the type of uh, construction that you get. So this is a mess, OK? I'm writing it out just to illustrate how much of a mess this is. But when you do this, you kind of observe a few things. OK, the first thing you observe is that the strategy, that's the thing on the far left, is defined recursively, right? Basically, the strategy for player i is, is defined in terms of some constraints that depend on the strategies of other players at other times. And those are, of course, defined you know, analogously. So these are coupled and nested together over time. And if there's capital T time steps in the game, there's capital T levels of nesting. So this is not like a bi-level problem. This is a T-level problem. And at each of T levels, there's an equilibrium problem, not an optimization problem. So this is uh, pretty gross to stare at. But that's what it is. And uh, if we want to have a prayer of solving this efficiently, we're going to end up needing to evaluate derivatives of these guys. But they're implicitly defined, they're recursively defined. So God help us. This is a tough problem. So basically, the way this works is you end up having to make some approximations. And what we do is we, we, we neglect higher order derivatives of these implicit functions. But if we only focus on first order information, it's actually pretty easy to obtain it via kind of implicit differentiation. So in practice, what ends up happening is something that looks like sequential quadratic programming with a couple of uh, bells and whistles. And you end up with an output block that I'm not going to read out, but looks suspiciously like IOQR. Um, the really key thing is that the blue box that I've circled is solving an LQ game, not an LQR problem. 
And that LQ game needs to be solved in a feedback information fashion, meaning it needs to be solved with a dynamic program, not any other method. And um, I'm happy to go into further details, but I just, for the sake of time, I know I'm running a little short. We, uh, so, so I'm glad we took questions, but I just wanna, wanna show you at least some of the results. So this will get some of the homotopy uh, questions that we had before. Just a quick illustration of what this actually looks like. Let's say I've just, I'm cooking up a scenario where cars or pedestrians or whatever are trying to interchange places, go right to left or left to right, avoid colliding with one another, uh, and staying inside uh, the, the lane here or the hallway. Um, what I can do is just pick 500 random initial guesses to start this algorithm and just run the algorithm a bunch of times and see what happens. So if I do that uh, and cluster the trajectories, you know, the solutions, basically everything converges uh, super reliably. And uh, there are three equilibria that we find. And these are exactly the homotopies you would hope to see. Basically, the guy in the middle either goes straight across and the other guys hug the wall and let him pass, or the guy in the middle interchanges place with one of the guys at the top or the bottom. Convergence, super reliable. Uh, you can see the number of iterations is, you know, comparable to what you'd expect with a uh, single agent method, because no surprise, second order convergence, it's fast. Um, so, so this is a pretty reliable thing. We've also done this, um, you know, just when I was finishing up my PhD, I had the, a lot of fun to go up and put this on a test airplane, at, uh, the test facility of Boeing's uh, out in central Washington and, you know, works just fine, can solve, solve times typically, you know, a couple milliseconds, no biggie. Um, and that's like on my laptop, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, so the bottom line here is that multi-agent interactions are really natural to write down as dynamic games, but the information structure and particularly the feedback structure is really subtle. So uh, what I've shown you is that we can actually solve both the open loop and the feedback versions of this type of problem in real time. Uh, and just as like a little uh, epilogue to this part of the talk, uh, you know, uh, these ideas, since they were first published by, you know, others and myself, um, they've kind of started to trickle into other other people's thinking. So this was a workshop I um, was speaking at last year at RSS, uh, 2021 in RSS. And the speaker right before me actually was uh, at Waymo. And I was very uh, interested to see that the part I boxed in blue, and that sounds suspiciously familiar here. So um, they were doing something very slightly different, but uh, basically boiled down to the same sorts of stuff. All right. Um, OK, so I want to pause here. Uh, I know that. Um, we're kind of, I wanna make sure to allow time for questions. And uh, I did have more planned to talk about, but for the sake of time, maybe uh, can somebody let me know how time looks on your end? I think we have mm -hmm. like some time, maybe 15 minutes or even more. Okay, let me let me try to talk about, um, let, let's, Let's not take questions right now. Let me just spend um, five more minutes kind of talking about the inverse problem, because I think that that will probably be of interest to several of you. And then we'll just take questions about all of it for you know maybe 10 minutes at the end. Does that sound good? All right. Yeah. So um, basically, the inverse problem is kind of getting at something that was addressed, or a question that was raised earlier, kind of, you know, what, what if players aren't acting rationally? Well, you know, another way to think about that problem is what if I don't know what players want? Okay, so uh, here what I'm showing is just an example of cars driving on the highway. Um, maybe we can imagine that we're one of these cars and, you know, we see uh, maybe some noisy sensor readings of where other cars are over time. So maybe this is a thing on the far right. This is, you know, a cartoon. Um, so obviously you'd probably have way less noisy uh, state estimates than this, but the bottom line is, uh, if you don't know what players want, but you can observe them over time, it'd be really nice if you could back out what they were actually optimizing for in order to predict their behavior in the future uh, and predict it in the sense of solving a game. So um, this is what we're trying to do. And I just want to also give a shout out here. This is work uh, jointly done with, with several other folks, including the sense who's on the call. So uh, uh, if you've got you know questions after I leave here, uh, Vince, I'm sure would be more than happy to talk about it. Um, so uh, anyway, this is what we were after in this uh, inverse problem. And uh, the way that we think about this is kind of in terms of a maximum likelihood problem. So if you're um, just thinking about, 
um, trying to so like take noisy sensor measurements and filter and estimate, okay, I, I saw their position or maybe I saw range and bearing and I want to estimate where uh, everything was over time. Well, I would solve a, a nonlinearly squares problem and I would try to maximize the likelihood or you know the fidelity of the observations that I um, got subject to some constraints that might be dynamic feasibility or um, something else. But basically, uh, it would be some kind of constrained maximum likelihood problem. Well, uh, all we do is we just kind of just take the game view and we say, okay, we're going to also try to make our observations look very likely by choosing trajectories of other players, uh, control inputs for other players, and this theta variable, which is kind of uh, parameterizing the objectives, the unknown objectives of all the players. So we'll try to choose those two such that the observations we measured with sensors are likely while the trajectory XU is a Nash equilibrium for the objectives we uh, parameterized with theta. So this is a mouthful, but basically that's that's the idea. We're baking in those Nash equilibrium uh, conditions that we saw earlier into constraints for this problem. And when you do that, you end up with, you know, under some other uh, regularity assumptions, you end up here. This, these are the open loop Nash conditions um, we used those just because they avoid all that query nesting. Um, actually, there's some, some ongoing work that's going to get submitted at the end of the week, hopefully, to, to do this for, for feedback. But anyway, um, uh, you can kind of take the Nash conditions and impose them as constraints on a maximum likelihood problem. And that's what we do. And, um, and uh, just for the sake of time, I'll skip what the baseline is, but the baseline's uh, kind of not really um, all that interesting, I think. And the idea is that we can actually outperform uh, other techniques by solving this uh, constrained version of the problem. And so here what I'm showing is uh, the kind of error we have in estimating the parameters of players. And I'm doing this is a pretty extensive Monte Carlo study where we can consider different levels of sensor noise um, and uh, just see how well we can estimate everything. You can see that we're doing quite a bit better than baseline approaches. Um, uh, I should say baseline approaches, they kind of boil down to um, first filtering and estimating the trajectories of all the players and then solving what ends up being a linear least squares problem to uh, estimate the parameters of players' objectives. So um, that's uh, kind of a, a, a sequential estimation approach, whereas we solve the full thing all at once. And by doing that, we're kind of allowing the game to impose a prior on the estimation problem, and that, of course, reduces error. So we do that, and then the other thing that's nice is if you care about predicting the future or decision-making in the future from different initial conditions, the costs that we infer, the objectives that we infer, are way more useful for that type of problem. So if you actually want to solve a planning and prediction problem in the future using the costs we inferred, you should really you do, do the coupled problem that we just showed rather than some sort of sequential baseline approach. And here, I also point out this is on a log scale, so the, the importance is even more, uh, the, the difference is even more important here. All right, so the message for this, this kind of quick uh, overview inverse problem is just that dynamic games are a really flexible tool, and game theory can provide a really strong prior and estimation sorts of settings. Um, something I didn't show is also relevant, we've kind of extended these types of ideas to slam problems. So if you're solving a slam problem, but you know, you know that some of the LIDAR hits or something are coming off of other cars that are behaving rationally in a game, you can exploit that extra information to improve the, the estimation performance. So um, also results there that I'm happy to discuss. Uh, but basically, game theory provides a strong prior and in inverse problems in estimation. Um, that's all I brought, uh, all I had technically. Uh, I want to really acknowledge some wonderful collaborators and especially a shout out to, to Vince here. Um, but it's, it's really a, a group effort and uh, I want to thank you all for your attention and take questions, so. First of all, thank you, Dave, for your nice talk. Let us. Uh, so I have like a couple of very, very small questions. Um, am I correct that for when we're talking about state X, it's mostly like a dynamical, uh, I don't know, and maybe statical constraints on the position, velocity, like acceleration, etc. So 
here we don't have like context map information encoded in X. We lost. I think you froze. David, can you hear us? Oh. Uh, it seems maybe uh, probably. Wait, I can't hear anybody. This is weird. Oh. Can you hear uh, us right now? Right now? David? Testing, David. Can you hear oh us? Oh my gosh. Google, don't do this to me. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah, we okay. can hear you. Uh, can hear you. Uh, well, yeah. hold on. Try saying something. Okay. No. Yes, okay. Uh, I still can't hear you. Uh, let me leave and return. Uh, All right, I'll be right back. Okay. I think there's some like very bomb delay. From east coast to west coast. No, Austin. Ah, yeah, it's Austin. Three hour three. Can you hear us, David? Yeah, muted. muted. You were muted. You muted though. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, can you hear us right now, David? One, two, one, two, three. We cannot hear you. David, we cannot hear you. I think you're muted, but can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, now I can hear you. Sorry, it was my AirPods were being stupid. Anyway, okay. all right. Nice, uh, nice. Sorry about that. Okay, guys. Okay. Uh, questions? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Can can can, can, can I? Hear? Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> we have some sort of echo. Oh, okay. All right. Back to AirPod time. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. How's that? Uh, one, two, three. Okay, oh, okay. Cool, right cool. now it's okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the, yes. Let, let me just repeat the question. It's very simple. Uh, am I correct that when we are talking about the state in your equations for x, uh, for x we have like some things like acceleration, position, velocity, etc., and we don't have any um, encoding of map information here. Um, yeah, so so the map information that would appear in the objective or in the constraints is kind of my assumption. I was kind of so so like the map information maybe is like uh, a penalty you impose or a constraint you impose on leaving the lane or going off the road or uh, hitting a pedestrian or something like that. Somebody that's not uh, a decision maker in the game that would uh, appear in the objective for a player or in a constraint for that player. That's kind of the way I've. Uh, constructed things. I see. Which, by the way, that's that's exactly how you would do it in a standard MPC thing, too. Uh -huh. And the second question is, uh, did you try, for example, your methods on top of some, I don't know, motion prediction or similar data sets, like how to... Yeah, yeah. so uh, actually, we were kind of very eager to try this out on the uh, Waymo uh, interaction, interaction prediction data set. Um, and uh, I think that the short version of this story is that that data set was actually quite a bit of a challenge to uh, to deal with. And like, for example, they didn't actually release the like road, you know, like road connectivity data. And they didn't specify like which lanes, like the directionality of a lane. So you have to kind of back all this up, uh, all this out. And uh, I think, you know, my impression of dealing of working with that data was that it was really intended for people who wanted to dump it into uh, a neural network and they'd really done a lot of engineering effort to make that easy but they didn't really do much effort to make it you know like there was we, we had to do quite a lot of engineering effort to build out kind of standard routing infrastructure and if you don't you know just like IOQR is gonna not do great if you have a terrible route uh, right like if you don't know which lanes to be following, IOQR is not going to solve your problem. Same thing with this. So bottom line is we found that in situations where we were able to kind of correctly infer like what the road geometry looked like and correctly predicts like uh, roughly which lanes players would try to be in, the game was wonderful. Uh, but there were also kind of lots of like stupid corner cases where 
that data set had just like made the problem stupidly annoying. Um, and we decided not to waste our effort on that. I see, I see. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? So I think like a lot of these ideas, um, seems also like echo with a lot of those multi agent IL kind of people, right? Like if you are trying to do, um, trying to do this blowout, you know, in timestamp and also not equipping, I think there's also, yeah. a lot, also a lot of work on like multi agent IL. So how do you view the connection or? Yes, yeah. yeah. So I guess um, multi agent RL, I would say is, uh, there's kind of two ways that people use those letters uh, or the, 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 that phrase. There's way number one is to describe a set of problems. And the set of problems that people are describing are games. They're typically stochastic games, uh, whether they're over finite state spaces or infinite state spaces, uh, that's, you know, um, depends on the setting. But basically, they're stochastic games. They're almost always stochastic feedback games, which are played over an infinite time horizon. But Bottom line is they're a stochastic game. So the class of games that I've been describing was deterministic games. Essentially, all the mechanics uh, are largely the same. Um, so if you're referring to a set of problems when you think multi-agent RL, you should be translating synonymously to everything I just talked about. Um, on the other hand, people often also talk about algorithms. So people will talk about like uh, uh, you know, policy gradient algorithms that uh, people apply simultaneously for all the players. Those are algorithmic decisions. So it's not a class of problem, it's a class of algorithm. And those are algorithms are appropriate in certain situations. Maybe if you don't know uh, the, uh, like an algebraic description of players' objectives or constraints or dynamics, if you don't have access to that stuff, then yeah, maybe some of these policy gradient algorithms or, or so forth, those might be appropriate. If you have that information, like it'd be pretty, like pretty stupid to ignore it. So, uh, so that's um, basically the class of algorithms that I've described is uh, very appropriate for settings like autonomous driving, where you know you know how cars drive, and you typically have an algebraic description for what at least you want, and you can probably model what other players want similarly. And if you have that information, use it. And if you use it, you can solve the problem in milliseconds rather than training on a TPU for a couple of days. So that's basically the, the way I see the difference. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I like fully understand. So you mean like um, in your setting is a deterministic model for the transition model versus mm -hmm. some of those mod agents is uh, stochastic. So that, that's that's true. So everything I talked about today was deterministic. I should also point out, though, that in the multi-agent context, almost all the time, the only thing that's stochastic in like a random, you know, if you just go on Google Scholar and look up multi-agent RL, I will bet a hundred bucks that the first paper you click on said has a deterministic dynamics model, transition model, and a stochastic uh, control, a stochastic policy. And the stochastic policy is just an artifact of the you know, they basically folks just want to use a policy gradient algorithm, which requires a stochastic policy. So it's an artifact of the algorithm, not of the problem. So I, I'd say like th there's a lot of like finesse here. Yeah, I mean, like I understand the transition model is uh, deterministic because it's based on physics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's also a lot of uncertainties of uh, how the future loads out, right? Like. If mm -hmm. you're out of state and if you take certain actions, other people can take all kinds of actions. So you have like potential multiple different futures. So there's also stochastic in that sense. Well, so so hold on. So why would you ever have multiple different futures? The only reason, if the physics is deterministic, the only reason that would ever happen is if players' strategies were stochastic. Yeah. So yeah. if you're restricting yourself to the set of deterministic strategies, then everything is deterministic, no rocket science here. The only way you would ever get a stochastic policy is if you, the, you know, basically you, the engineer, decide, you know, gee, I want to consider stochastic policies. And there can be really good reasons for that, right? So great reason would be like, let's say I'm playing tag with you. Probably 
you should, uh, you know, at some point make some random decisions about whether you go right or you go left, because if I'm trying to catch you, that's going to like juke me out. So that, is, so there are totally games in which stochastic policies make sense. I've judiciously ignored those here. Uh, I've done other work on those, and I'd be happy to talk about it probably at a later talk. But, um, but yeah, the bottom line is, uh, if you restrict your attention to deterministic policies, then, you know, that's the problem you have. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think like then that might go back, uh, goes back to my previous uh, question about, you know, the assumption of uh, the, you know, the problem that you are um, solving, right? Like mm -hmm. you're assuming the policies that deterministic. Uh, I, yeah. I think, yeah, it makes the problem easier to solve and you can try this uh, nice optimization kind of thing. But, you know, in practice, for example, how, how, how you know, how accurate is this assumption, right? Like people's, I mean, if this is true, can we say like uh, if we also don't don't have this compute constraint and we can just apply your method on self-driving and we solve the self-driving problem? Well, hold on. I mean, I'm not saying that. Uh, for, first of all, there's a couple things. Uh, there's no compute constraint here. The compute is equivalent to ILQR. So if you're comfortable with ILQR, you should be comfortable with this. Um, so, you know, uh, Boeing is comfortable putting it on an airplane. Uh, it's it's not 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 a big deal compute wise. Um, the real difficulty is figuring out what the heck do do people want, right? So this is that inverse problem. Uh, so all the forward solution techniques, the ILQRs of the world, that uh, depends on having a known description of the problem. In particular, knowing how players can act, knowing what their dynamics are, and knowing what they might want. Um, so you know, basically, all I've said is that if you know that information, then I've solved your problem for you, more or less. Um, and so basically, I've just pushed the problem down the line. And uh, you can think about it as if you want to predict what players are going to do in the future. Uh, what I've changed the problem into is I've said, no, 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 don't predict exactly what they're going to do. Just predict what they want to do. Like, what are they trying to optimize for? And that might be a really hard thing. That might involve: Do they want to make a right turn or a left turn? Do they want? Uh, do they want to overtake me? Uh, are they distracted and they're like just going to be totally non-reactive? They're just not going to change, you know, their behavior even if they're uh, approaching a head-on collision with somebody. Like those are all really hard things to infer, and I'm certainly not solving that problem. We're only barely touching the tip of that iceberg, so I'm not trying to say that this solves all the problems. All I'm trying to say is that if you've adequately predicted what players want to do, then I've given you a way to solve the coupled kind of trajectory prediction and planning problem from that point forward. OK, I see. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. And yeah. then, like, you know, the as you said, you just to push the problem to this uh, reverse problem, trying to predict the intent. And over yeah. there, I would uh, assume there's a lot of stochastic. And then there's like also the challenge mm -hmm. of uh, yeah. why self-driving car is not <laughs> why. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. It's a serious, I mean, like, I'm not trying to trivialize the problem at all. I'm just trying to say that uh, rather than predicting, like, this is definitely what this other car is going to do, guys, or like, this is stochastically what they're going to do, but it's not conditioned on what I want to do, um, then, uh, I'm basically saying, no, no, don't do that. Let's just couple everything together. And if you do that, I can solve your problem for you pretty fast. That's all I'm saying. Um, the stochastic part and sort of like considering multiple potential things players might want, like I don't know if they want to go right or if they want to go left. Let me plan uh, taking that uncertainty into account. Um, that's uh, also like lots of ongoing work. So um, I, I think that a colleague of mine is going to talk about a version of this uh, in a, probably in a couple months or something here so so probably that story will will be better better suited to that talk but but um the bottom line is these tools can adapt to different types of problems stochastic deterministic all over the place okay yeah thanks yeah uh sorry there was a question in the chat um do you think about hedge strategies giving multiple cold possibilities yeah so that's exactly what i was just alluding to so if you're familiar with like contingency planning um, or, you know, uh, branching, like considering, okay, like at this time, maybe uh, 
the pedestrian might jaywalk or not jaywalk or, or something like that. Um, and trying to plan, uh, you know, like a, a sequence of actions to take. And then, you know, after, you know, imagine that after a couple of seconds, the pedestrian will have committed to either jaywalking or not. And then you can kind of split out two, uh, two plans from that point forward. So that's called a contingency plan. At, at least that's, that's the term I've heard for that. Um, you can also do that for games. That's that's the thing that I was alluding to that a, a colleague will talk about here. I think is signed up for for a couple months from now. So, um, so hopefully more interesting stuff on that later. Other questions? Good to see a lot, a lot of from familiar, uh, familiar friendly faces here. So. Uh, mm -hmm. So let us maybe think one more time, our speaker. Yeah, thank you, thank you David. Yeah, yeah, happy to hear. Anytime, guys. Yeah, thank great you. talk, David. All right, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Thank you, David. Bye. All right. Yeah. Bye, bye, guys.